Hello everyone, this is Teresa Connor at the One Water Solutions Institute at Colorado State University. And we are uh, hosting what was developed as a monthly webinar series on um, software tools that are being developed at Colorado State University as part of the eRAMS program. eRAMS is a cloud-based platform that supports online services in kind of open source GIS. Uh, this program started in about 2008 and really building upon what was emerging as open source GIS then to build an integrative um, platform for research to be done. And it's evolved to the point now where we can provide uh, integrated GIS services and we're developing tools that were once done as part of spreadsheets or other private systems into open source GIS tools. And you will see if you go to our website, which is erams.com backslash One Water Solutions Institute, there's a software page that includes a number of tools that are, um, that are available for use, that are open source, freely available, and including some hydrology information, uh, including a comprehensive flow analysis for any stream gauge information you may have, and urban water tools. Today we're going to be talking about the pipe risk screening tool that you'll find here and we'll get into. But there's also agricultural water management tools and just some GIS platform. With the emerging um, open source GIS uh, tools available, it's, it, we're able to create these and make them freely available. And they've been supporting research for the past eight years and now they're strong enough to really support application of use. Uh, within that software, there is some training going to go to this page where we have um, a number of webinars and videos that we've created. We will be recording this uh, webinar today and putting it on this website. But you can create an eRAMS account and store your project information as you're going. Or you can usually log in as a non or do a non-login version and just do an analysis without having to save it. So there's a number of training things available and within that training we do record these um, webinars and make a YouTube channel that uh, where you'll be able to find some tutorials on our programs including GIS basics and different programs that you can look out. These generally go for about 20 minutes um, and there's a thing of how to create a user's account which is fairly simple. So all of this is really aimed at creating kind of open source GIS, share your information, your water information with groups that you decide, um, or for, you can also make them available to anyone uh, so that you know it's easier to do decision making and other um, within the complexities of water data. Today what we're going to do are uh, webinar will focus on the pipe risk screening tool. This was a spreadsheet tool that was developed as part of a water research foundation project that Dr. Neil Grigg was the PI and uh, they've converted it using um, Python and Java and other code. They've taken all of that logic and converted it to a GIS tool. Dr. Daryl Fontaine was instrumental in that conversion and is going to lead us through today's webinar. So if you on our software you, or on our uh, website, there's a description and tool output, and you can, we'll go just to the tool um, pretty soon. There's also a link to the user's guide, which is a handout in today's webinar, and you may have received it through video, and we will have a place where we store this video tutorial. So right now, we're just going to go ahead and go to get started, and we are going to uh, let Dr. Fontaine take us through an example of um, the pipe risk screening tool. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, answer them through or ask them through the questions or through the chat. We will be monitoring that as we go and we should have time for questions at the end as well. So Dr. Fontaine, if you could take us through, I'm going to hand him the mouse. Okay, well thank you. It's uh, nice to be here. Uh, I'm a retired professor now uh, and this was a project that I, I worked on uh, my role in this project was to develop the spreadsheet tool that uh, we originally used for the uh, pipe risk screening tool. 
Now, when we were developing that, I worked with Dr. Grigg. We worked with a number of users, and one of the things that we uh, found was that many of the users had GIS data. And while we were focused on the spreadsheet tool, it became obvious that if we could um, take the calculations we were making and then put those back into GIS, you could get a nice visual display of the, the output of the tool. And that kind of led the discussion that, that evolved with uh, uh, Dr. Mazdak Arabi and Dr. Neil Gregg and myself to move this into an environment, uh, in particular the, the ERAMS environment, where uh, you would be able to merge the GIS data and the data from the uh, screening tool. And in fact, we took the calculations from the spreadsheet, and as Theresa mentioned, those are now built into this tool. Now, the other aspect that, that we wanted to uh, focus on is that there's two ways you could use this. Initially, what, what I was doing was just logging into ERAMS and then adding in the information from the spreadsheet tool to GIS data. However, one of the things that's important is that a lot of uh, organizations, the, you know, I'm looking at the participant list here from a number of different uh, water management, asset management organizations, is very important uh, about the integrity and the privacy of their data. So the nice thing about the tool that I'm going to show you is that none of your data is, is stored anywhere. You can actually upload your data, make the analysis, and close the tool, and the data, the data is not there. In other words, it's volatile to the use of the tool. And for some people, that's really important, that it's your data, you can use the tool, uh, but then your data is secure. Now, as we get started, I also need to point out that um, my area of focus was really on the spreadsheet development side. I'm not really a GIS software expert at all. In fact, uh, primarily everything I've done in GIS has been within the ERAMS environment. And uh, Dr. Neil Grigg is really the domain expert in terms of this, but I'm going to take you through and show you the, the evolution of the tool. So um, we brought up the tool. I'm going to click OK. That's just a description of the purpose. And I'll come over to the map and go to Geospatial Layers, Spatial Layers, and I want to add a layer and I want to add a shape file. So I have a shape file that includes. Um, information that uh, from Colorado State University. Once I've uploaded this data, I'm just going to go ahead and close this dialog. I'm going to click on the spatial layer, and I'm going to zoom to layer. And there you see the water pipe segment network for Colorado State University. Now, as I mentioned, when we were developing the tool, in fact, one of the issues we ran into working with various agencies is people would, would give us data that we could use to test our tool development, but they didn't want that data shared. And I wanted to be able to use this uh, in our classes at CSU. So CSU was kind enough to share with me some of their information, the information that they had on their uh, water pipe segment network. Now, the location and the uh, year of installation, the diameters, the type of material is actually their data. Everything else in here is fictitious, and we're going to look at the various aspects of here. But I just wanted to make a disclaimer at, at the beginning that while the location of the pipe segments is correct, everything else you're going to see in terms of the other parameters, number of breaks, service levels, et cetera, is fictitious data I made up actually so that I could get some good assignments in the classes that I was teaching. So if we come back over to the tab that says Pipe Risk Assessment, now what this is going to allow us to do is going to allow us to bring in the information that we need from this, our um, spatial layer, and I'll go ahead and choose that layer that we have. And I want to talk a little bit about the types of information that we're going to, to need. As we were developing this tool, we looked at what a number of different agencies were, were doing. Some of the really large agencies had collected a lot of data. They were moving uh, toward the 
the use of, say, formal probabilistic distributions to try to estimate such things as likelihood of future breaks based on uh, previous break information. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you had um, smaller organizations that were using point-based systems to where they would say, well, if the pipe gets to a certain age, that's a certain number of points. Uh, if it has a certain number of pipe breaks, that's a certain number of points. And so you kind of had this broad spectrum. What we targeted would be the smaller uh, type of agencies that maybe didn't have a big formalized system in place. That was one of the reasons we went to a spreadsheet approach. And this uh, new implementation, ERAMS, certainly fits that. Um, but with the possibilities to be able to expand this later to include more formalized processes, such as a formalized probability distribution. So the, the three main aspects that we looked at that we said would impact the likelihood of a pipe segment experiencing um, a failure or a break would be number one, the age. So the longer the segment has been there, the more likely it is it's going to need to be replaced. The second would be the number of uh, pipe break history. Has it broken in the past? How many times has it broken? Again, the, the thought being that the more a pipe segment has broken, the more likely it will be to break again. And then the third aspect of that was the service level. And by service level, we're talking about external forces on the pipe segment. This could be things like soil conditions. It could be uh, high pressure zones. It could be traffic loads over the pipe. And those were the three that we, that we looked at. So if we click, we'll start with the age. If we click on that one, what we have to do is we have to find the field that has the data corresponding to what we need. Now, as, as Teresa um, mentioned previously, if, we, if you look at the handout that you were sent, we described some of the information that's required in terms of the data that you need to do this. And the data that we need is in this, for this field, you can look down through the information we have, is the year installed. Now before I talk about this, I want to just come back to the map for a second. And on this spatial layer, I'm going to click on it, then I'm going to choose open attribute table. So one of the things that is required uh, to use this interactive tool is that in your, in addition to your spatial data, you also have in your attribute table the information that's on that handout. We need to know the diameter of the pipe segment, the material that pipe segment is built out of, the year it was installed, the length, the number of breaks, breaking status, service, location, repair difficulty. I'm going to be talking about these. Now, there are some fields you'll see on the webinar to the right of this that have level one. There's a number of fields. Actually, when you first upload your data, those fields are blank. And when you evaluate, those fields get populated. And I'll come back later and show you how to save this calculated data if you want to and download it so that you could look at it offline and perhaps even a different GIS program. Now, let's go ahead and close this for now. So those that information has to be uh, in the attribute table. And there's a couple of ways that that can be done. Um, one of the ways that, uh, or the way that I did this initially was I took the um, information that's required and I put that in a spreadsheet. And then we have a, a tool that allows you to add a table. So I added that spreadsheet and then under the spatial layer, one of my options is to join, and I join that spreadsheet. And so what you see here, if you go back to the attribute table, is that I have this material. There's something on here called a, um, a J join ID, and this was the pipe ID that was used when we actually combined those tables. So however you want to get this information in, it has to be part of the attribute table and your spatial layer. Now, the concept we use for um, identifying this, what we call it a, a likelihood index, it's not a pure probability, but just an estimate of the likelihood index. As I mentioned, we were moving, we were trying to move more toward a point-based system. 
but we also wanted something that could be replaced with a probability distribution from zero to one. So we chose a likelihood index, which will go from zero to one. And uh, to be able to kind of estimate a, a curve, you can put up to nine points, nine values. You see we have in here from age of zero up to um, 200. Um, you know, when we were developing this, most people said 100 years would be nice, but 200 years was probably more practical. And I think you'll see in the CSU data, we have a number of pipes that are well over 100 years. So we have at, at 200 years, we say, well, the likelihood that that's going to need replacement is one. And then we selected various values in between. And if you just hover over this view graph, you'll see a shape of the, this function. Now, this is purely for illustration purposes. But what I wanted to show you is that we have uh, a likelihood estimate during the first year, the first year of insulation, that you could have some breakage just due to insulation issues. And then we drop that back down. You could create any shape of curve, really, that you wanted to under this. The other point we wanted was that we wanted the users, because a lot of times the users, I think, underestimate how much they know about their system. And you could really get a lot of information about the people like yourself that are taking this webinar that really have a good judgment, engineering judgment feel for what these likelihoods are. So we wanted this to be customizable by the user, okay? So that's the age likelihood factor. Now, one of the things that we were told when we were developing this tool, well, this is nice, we, have a, we can come up with a general age curve, but you know some materials in our particular location don't break as, or break more than some other materials. So the second field that we have for information is called materials. And that's where you can put in what we call a modification factor for the different type of materials. And again, in this case, the tool found a, an attribute name material, so it, it went ahead and put that in as a default. Again, if you did not have something there, you would go down and find the one that matched. And these are just a set of numbers that would allow you to modify that age likelihood index function. So for example, let's say in our particular case that ductile iron we thought was failing at twice the rate of all the other materials. So what we could do is we could put a two instead of a one for ductile iron. You could make that a two. And what that would do is that would take that likelihood function for age. And if it's a ductile iron pipe segment, Essentially what it would do is it would double it. So we had it going to one in 200 years, it would go to one at 100 years. So in other words, it would make it break twice as fast, or, or not make it break, but it would change the likelihood based on age by the factor that you put in. Okay, the next thing um, we have is we have pipe breaks and service level. Let's go ahead and talk about the pipe breaks first, and then I'll come back and talk about the service level since I'm trying to give you a little background in, into how we came up with some of this information. Now, again, the idea was that uh, the more breaks you're having, maybe the more likely you would uh, be to have breaks um, in the future. And there's three fields. We have the number of breaks, the length of the pipe segment, and there's one called breaking status. Now, the Attribute for that in my data set is called breaking status. Again, you name your attributes whatever you want, and then uh, you just assign those in the tool. And the way that we designed this was uh, there was a national average, uh, which is probably still the same number now. I know at the time we built the tool, the national average was three-tenths of a break per mile per year. And so what we did is we would take the actual data in terms of uh, the number of breaks and the length and the breaking status. I'll talk a little bit about the breaking status in a second. And um, what that meant was that we would then compute a ratio to the national average. So a ratio value of one implies that the pipes are breaking right at the national average. We gave that a likelihood index of 0.5. Again, these are numbers that the user can, can change. If it's a two, it meant that uh, those pipe segments, or that particular pipe segment, was breaking at twice the national average, and so that got a likelihood 
index of one, and then at zero, it had a zero. So that's how we define that value. Now, what this breaking status refers to is it refers to the status of the breaks. I'm going to go back to the attribute table for a second. It referred to uh, the status of these breaks. In other words, uh, we just used a, a simple one, two, and three. One being that the breaking status would be about what we would expect. If for some reason it's breaking more often than we might expect, we could make that breaking status a two or a three depending upon, upon what happened. Uh, typically, I think that in most cases is going to be a one. But it was just another way to add a little bit of emphasis on a pipe segment with a number of breaks that maybe was experiencing some, some particular problems. OK. So now I'll come back to the, the service level. And the service level, what that's referring to is that's referring, as I said, to these external factors that could impact uh, a um, pipe segments such as traffic load, high pressure zone, corrosive soils, any other certain conditions, again, that might cause it to fail more quickly. The attribute for that is service. And we just use a, a simple one, two, three in here. By the way, I mentioned these could be up to um, nine values on, like, for example, the likelihood value on, on age. Uh, the minimum you'd have to have is two. You'd have to have at least a straight line segment. But, but for here, we just had a simple one, two, and three. And so we could just use uh, those three values. And we, for this example, um, or for this demonstration, I use 0 0.1, 0 0.25, and 0.5 for likelihood estimates. So what we have is we have a likelihood based on age, a likelihood based on the number of pipe breaks. Age is modified by materials and a likelihood based on service, service conditions. So it's three likelihood values. Now we need to combine those into an overall likelihood. If you can think about it as three probabilities, you want to come together with an overall combined probability. And that's what we call the overall likelihood. And the overall likelihood is a combination of, we call level one, which is based on the age only. Interestingly, in the data that I saw that was shared with us by various agencies, typically the thing that's most avail available is age and material. The things that are harder to come uh, get a, a handle on sometime or have data on are number of breaks and service level. So if you choose a level one for the likelihood calculation, it'll base it solely on that likelihood function for age. If you chose a level two, it would base it on uh, age and the number of breaks. Now these numbers are what we call importance factors. And the way that we get the weights, we're going to combine these by weighting them together, is we take these the importance factors that we put in, we add them up. So if I add one and one, I get two. And then I will apply one half to age and one half to number of breaks. So half of the likelihood value based on age plus half of the likelihood value based on the number of breaks will give me the combined likelihood for level two. Level three combines age, number of breaks, and the service level. So now again, I have three values. Let's suppose that I think that the number of breaks in my particular situation is more representative of what might happen than either the age or the service. So I've given this a two. So if you look at this, if I add these numbers together, that's 4. So 1 over 4, this would be 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.25. So again, what you're seeing is that by putting a 2, I'm giving twice as much emphasis on the likelihood function for breaks compared to the other two likelihood functions. And we're going to ch get a chance in a second to select which one we want to use. Now, the final thing is to look at what we call cost estimation. Really, I think about this as a consequence index, and that's really what it's, it's focused on, is we have a likelihood of a particular pipe segment breaking, but what's the consequence of that breaking? Is that a major, a big water main under a major thoroughfare right in front of a hospital, for example? That's going to be a whole lot different than the water main that broke in front of my little cul-de-sac a few years ago where you only had half a dozen houses around the cul-de-sac. 
So Dr. Grigg wanted to come up with an index that would reflect the consequences of this. Again, one being a very high consequence site, towards zero being a much lower consequence site. And he used three factors for that, the pipe diameter, the location, and a repair difficulty estimate. And again, if you look back on the, I'll do this one more time, go back to this attribute table. These are some relative numbers that he put in in terms of uh, location and repair difficulty. Again, one would be an easy location, easy repair. Uh, three might be a very difficult location, perhaps a very difficult repair. Again, it was based on this point system, but kind of a judgment thing about um, the relative difficulty of those. And of course, the pipe diameter is important. That's going to have an aspect on that. And then finally, with these, again, we can use these relative important factors because we're going to weight these, these indices and come up with an overall consequence index. And in this example, you see I'm giving twice as much weight to um, location I'm in to repair or to size. And again, those are numbers that you can change and you can take a look at uh, a likelihood function. Now, in this case, we don't see the likelihood function as much of the fact that uh, what Dr. Brick thought was important is not just give a consequence index alone between 0 and 1, because what does it mean to have a consequence index of 0.8? It might be more important if you could associate a relative cost to that. So, for example, you might have some relative costs depending upon the consequence index that you had. So, 0.3 here's an estimated cost, here's a, a 0.7 an estimated cost. Again, these are relative numbers just to illustrate, and these would be customized to your particular area. As you know, a very large pipe in a difficult location, what do you think about in relative terms? You're talking about in terms of money, because if you're making a presentation to city council, they're probably a lot more interested in money than they are in kind of a, a hard to identify with consequence index. So that's the information, and then we get to choose the uh, level we want. And actually, when they implemented this in ERAMs, and it, it's really true in the spreadsheet too, you could, they actually calculate all of these levels, but I'm going to select level three, which I'm going to use to do the, the risk. And then we click the tool to, we're going to include the cost, and I'll click the tool to evaluate. So it's evaluated this network, and if I go back to the map for a second, and again, I'll open up this attribute table, now what you would see is you would see as you scrolled over to the right, you'd see the level one, two, and three being calculated. You'd see a consequence index and a cost being calculated for this. You'd see the risk. The risk is the level that we've selected multiplied by the consequence index. That's a classic definition of risk, is the probability that something will happen multiplied times the consequence if that happens, okay? And so you see these have been calculated and then they've been populated here. If you wanted to, at this point, you could click here and download this to the shape file. And this, this is actually how I created the file that I opened in the first place ran an analysis, I saved it, and then you have this if you wanted to play with your calculations offline. Otherwise, once we close this, all these calculations will disappear. All right, so now we've, we've uh, created this. So let's take a look at um, looking, now using the GIS aspects to look at some of this information. So I would like to look at the risk and what I'm seeing right now is it's showing me the likelihood level three. So if I click here, I can look at this layer of properties. I'm going to go to symbology, and I'm going to change level three, which is the likelihood of break, to risk, which is actually the likelihood level three multiplied by the consequence index. And I will update the classifications. And there they are. There's my level of risk. And then my highest level of risk is, looks like about 0.37 to 0.65.
you can select a variety of ways you want to break this. I just use the I just just using the natural breaks for this demonstration. If I click on this symbol, I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit bigger so it's going to be easier for us to see. I'm going to update this and then I'm going to apply it. And now what I see back on our map is I see my highest risk section. So these are the pipe segments that have the highest risk of failure. Now if I wanted to get information on a particular segment, I could click this uh, identify icon, select a particular pipe segment, it will tell me the, the diameter, the material, the year it was installed, the number of breaks it's experienced, again number of breaks uh, and service levels in my case are fictitious, repair difficulty, it'll show me all that information about that segment. If I want to, I can zoom right down to that segment and see where that is. To come back, I click on this icon with the little red arrow that says go to previous extent. And then I click on this little icon to clear all graphics from the map. And I'm back to what I started. So now I can look at the risk. In a similar way, we could go back and we could change this attribute to something else that we'd like to, to look at. So for example, let's say I wanted to look at, now that I have this in, in a GIS form, it's wonderful to be able to filter. When we designed the spreadsheet, one of the things we did was built in filter capabilities so you could look at everything. But with the GIS, it's even much nicer. So let's say what I wanted to look at was a uh, number of breaks. I'm in the symbol field, I'm looking for the number of breaks. Now the number of breaks in my cases are going to be 0, uh, 1, 2, and 3. So I'm going to click on unique values and update the classifications. And then I'll scroll down. Let's say I'm looking at, uh, I'm interested in two breaks and three breaks. So I'm just going to change this symbology like I did before to make it easier for me to see. I'm going to choose a gray and make it a little bit bigger. And then for the three breaks, I'll come in and choose, a, say, a black and make that a little bit bigger and update that and apply it. And then there they are. Now, one thing that they built into the tool, which is really nice that I like, is this ability to toggle the output display. So if I click on this, what I'm looking at is only those attributes that I'm interested in. And all the rest are still there, but all the rest of the information, these pipe segments are still there. They're just harder to see. They're smaller. But here, you're seeing everything kind of at the same level, and it's a little harder to identify. So this toggle output display allows us to focus on the ones that we're interested in. So if I were to look at a particular pipe segment, then um, I could, for example, look at this. That should be a three, if I remember, three breaks. And sure enough, the number of breaks is three. Again, so the idea being that um, we could use this selection of the attributes to look at this various information. Now I want to demonstrate another tool because you often want to look at a combination of things. You may want to look at not just a single attribute but a combination. So I'm going to go back to the map. I'm going to go back and select my risk again. And the natural breaks. Click apply. Update classification, there we go. Click apply. That looks better. And I'll come back to my original map. So now I'm back at the, at the original map. Now this uh, query tool will allow us to look for uh, something similar to what we did, but we can do it in terms of just a, a query of this attribute table. So I'm going to demonstrate a couple of queries. First, a, a simple one for you, and then one that combines two attributes. So let's say that I wanted to um, look for the oldest pipes in my system. I could come in and I first of all I have to choose my shapefile. 
And then I have to select an attribute. I'm looking for um, year installed. And I'd like my year installed to be less than. And I'll come in and the sample value, this will show me all the data that I have in my in my database. So I'm going to click on 1924. And I wasn't around in 1924. But just as an example, I'm interested in the, the older pipes because you see we have some that go back to 1880. So I'll click on this one as an example. And then do next. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to run this query. Now the query has been run. It's you can see the it changed color, but it's somewhat hard to see. So I'm going to click back over here to map and click on my values here. And my underlying uh, information is still basically risk, but this selection is actually showing me what I've just queried. So if I click on that symbol, I'm going to make that a black. Hopefully this is coming out good for you on the webinar and update that and then apply it. Now I can see those older segments that match what I queried. And again, I can come back to this page and if I want to, I can toggle the output display and toggle it back on. But this allows me to then look at, at where all my older pipes are. And this is interesting because this is actually this area is actually the original area that the campus was built. And uh, most of these, for example, in the oval, these go back to 1880, cast iron pipes from 1880. Okay. So Dr. Fontaine, we have a question. Yes. <clears throat> it was back on the break. And they're wondering, is the number of breaks calculated using the whole system you were showing, or is it a certain area? It's for each pipe segment. For each pipe segment. Okay. Right. So For an individual pipe segment, how many breaks has that pipe segment experienced? Okay. And that's based on the input data. That's based on the input data. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, let's look at... Uh, uh, query with two attributes. So I'm going to come back up here and click this little X. This will unselect all the features, clear that query for me. Okay. And uh, we'll make a new query. And what I want to find is I want to find all the pipe segments that are made of ductile iron. Let me identify my shape file and attributes table. And I would like material equal to ductile iron, and I'd like the number of breaks greater than or equal to 2. So I'm looking for ductile iron pipe segments that have had at least two breaks, two or three breaks, and click Next. and run the query. Okay. Now because I changed that selection before, then that selection is still there on the map, the, the darker values. And again, these are showing me the the pipe segments that are spirit that there's not a lot of ductile iron pipe segments on the CSU campus, but I can, for example, pick one of these. And look at it. And this is ductile iron installed in 2008. And then according to, again, this fictitious data, that segment would have had two breaks. So that gives you an indication of how you can do um, complex queries. It's only two. You could combine a, a number more of these. You could do, as you notice in that query tool, a fair amount of um, looking at AND conditions and R conditions. And some of those, some of you who are real familiar with, uh, with GIS would be perhaps better able to know some of the things that you can do. Now, I want to show one last query. Oh, we have well, another we do question. We have another question. Uh -huh. is, um, over what 
time period is the number of breaks. Their record keeping, so it's that input data, is their ability to show time period or is it just what's in the data set? Oh, okay. Um, ideally, what you would want to have is from the time the pipe segment was installed, how many breaks has that pipe segment experienced? Mm -hmm. Now, the reality is this number of breaks data is very, very hard mm -hmm. to come by. Um, but it's kind of all we have at this point. Uh, but that was that was Dr. Briggs' concept, is if you had a particular pipe segment and you had the number of breaks that that segment had been, that particular segment had experienced since its installation, that's the data that you're looking for. If you replace that pipe segment, then it would have a new year of installation and you would keep breaks from that point. Okay. But I, I do understand the practical limitations on having that data available. So we have another question. Uh -huh of how are you calculating repair difficulty? What does it entail? Because you have locations separate from this category. Okay, so that's a good question. Let's come back to um, this cost estimation. And he's using this um, repair as an indication of repair difficulty. Now, at the time we created this, Dr. Grigg was trying to come up with something simple that he could put in into the tool to, the, the idea was that it, it was a tool that could be continued to be modified and updated. So he just used a, a, a very simple indicator for repair difficulty. He used the one, two, or three, where one would be the simplest repair that you could think of, and three might be a really difficult repair uh, in terms of what might be involved, not so much in the location, but in the actual repair of that particular pipe segment. Maybe there's some issues with other utilities that have mm -hmm. conflicts. Maybe it's it's an issue of, of um, how you're going to have to make that repair. Right? Again, that might be something that um, Teresa might be able to get Dr. Gregg to maybe comment on at some point. Um, but that, as best of my recollection, that was his concept in developing that. He started off with just a simple one, two, three scale. Okay, thank you. Is there a limit to the number of pipe segments? Uh, no. Uh, in the spreadsheet, in fact, one of the reasons we went to the GIS tool is when we created the spreadsheets, uh, there's theoretically no limit to, well, a million rows in a, in a spreadsheet page. But practically, the spreadsheets get very slow once you get somewhere around 8,000 pipe segments. I know that ERAMS has been tested by one of the users with something in the order of 10,000, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I don't. And with the, the ERAMS, there's really no, no limit in terms of the number of segments you have. It's very quick. That's okay. the advantage to making it cloud-based. Okay. So you're going to do one more query? I'm just going to do one more, and it's okay. something I think is important. At least it was important for me uh, in terms of thinking about this problem. And so I, I want to come back, and I want to do one more query. And what I'm going to look for, oops, sorry, that's not the one I wanted, this one. I don't have any saved queries. I want to look at material equal to unknown. Because in the data that we looked at, in many cases what we found was that people would know of where a pipe segment was. Mm -hmm. They may or may not know when it installed. Sometimes they did. But oftentimes they didn't know what the material was. And so one of the nice things I thought about when you come into the GIS world is that you can now, for example, run a query and you can look at for unknown. Now, you could have unknown in terms of number of breaks. This is a way to actually look at your data and figure out what's missing. So here's one of these pipe segments on the oval. And if I took a look at, at this particular pipe segment, it was built in 1880, but they don't know what the material is. Now, if I were to look at this pipe segment, 
I'm going to find, if I look at the information, I'll do that for you real quick. I'm going to find that that's also 1880 and it's cast iron. If I did that for the other segments around that pipe, turns out they're also all 1880 and cast iron. And it doesn't tell me exactly what that is, but it gives me a really good indication where I have missing data of maybe what might be there. So I like the idea of actually in the attributes when you build them, having some things that are unknown so that you could go back, use the GIS features to go back and actually look for that unknown data as a way to maybe try to focus any kind of data collections you might be able to, to have. And so this is now what we'd like to take all the questions that you might, you might have about this. Um, again, I'll answer as many of those as I can. But that's kind of an overview of, of the tool. And as I mentioned, again, unless you've gone back and downloaded this data, downloaded these calculations, once we close this tool, all of the data we uploaded is gone. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the security issue, that's the privacy issue that, that you can use. The other thing I want to point out is that there's, you don't have to have GIS on a computer to use this. In fact, I have run this tool on my phone, and I've run this tool on a tablet, and I've run this tool on a laptop or a computer. So this is something you could potentially take into a meeting on a tablet, pull up the tool, and be able to, you know, make the case for the what you think about in terms of your plan for which pipe segment you might want to replace in the upcoming year or two years or five years. And one other thing on um, the data and security, if you want to create a username and save the project, you can create an a, a ERAMS account and save your project and only share it with those people that you want to share it with. This does create a URL that you can send to stakeholders so they can view it, but that's up to you and your secure and how you want to administer the project. So there is typical um, security processes around the ERAM system so you can save a project and only share it with those that you want to save it or share it with if that is um, something you'd like to do if you're working with clients. And once again, the folks you share it with don't have to have GIS on their computer. It, can, it all works through the open source GIS on the internet. So all you need is an internet browser. So with that, we'll take any other questions that you can have. One thing I will note is we are recording this and I will send out the, we'll convert the recording to a YouTube video and send that out so that you can have that to refer back to. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, and there will be a survey follow-up if you have more questions. You can ask that, too. So, uh, as your questions are coming in, I'd like to encourage you. I mean, as I said, I've, I've retired from the university now. But, you know, I would really like to see the, this thing, because I worked on it, go forward. And it's important for us to know what works for you and what doesn't work for you and what thoughts you have on how we could modify the tool to make it more usable because we're very interested in creating something that could be helpful to you in terms of you managing your assets, particularly with respect to the pipe networks. Great. We're not getting many questions, any many more questions coming in. We'll wait, you know, just a little bit to see if you have them. Um, but I will mention we have another tool called the Integrated Urban Water Model. That is, <clears throat> we'll look at how indoor and outdoor conservation and alternative water supplies, um, such as gray water, storm water use, will impact potable water demands, and that will be our webinar next month. We'll be sending an invitation out for that. But it's once again GIS based, so all you do is put in your area you want to analyze, and um, 
and it will bring all of the climate, soil, and other type of data to to play in the analysis. So we've got a number of these type of tools that um, are starting to come out of the research phase and go into the application phase. So if you have any questions, let us know. We did get a question of, can you pose the URL to log in the ERAM tool? Yes, I can do that. Let me um, go do that. First of all, there is, a, if you just go to erams.com, There is a thing that says sign up, and it will, you can register with an email address so that you can create your own tool. And it, it will eventually take you to the resources page um, that kind of explains some of what eRAMS is. And now this page will be changing over time. And there's also, if one of the things I should mention, if you want to create your own app, you can do that on the open source GIS. So if there's a little programming that you need to do or you need to create an app, um, you know, to simplify some calculation, there is uh, resources to do that right here. But if you go to getting started, um, it will take you to either the GIS page the apps that are already there, how to use a developer, um, and I'm probably logged in, so it already probably has me on the login information. So we've got a question about the tool again. For the location portion of the consequence index, how is, how is this being brought in? Is it a simple one, two, three, and what is calculated before the data you brought into the tool? Could you expand yes. on that? Yes, so you're correct. Again, we started off something very simple. Uh, essentially, Dr. Grigg looked at this one, two, three. A one location would be a fairly low impact in terms of consequences. Again, the example might be they had to replace a pipe water main in, in my cul-de-sac. I would call that to be a, a fairly low location because there's no really traffic to deal with and it's just houses. There's no real um, big consequences to making that repair. A three might be something that might be maybe in terms of a, a major user, for example, a hospital might be a, a location if it's a water main that's serving water for the hospital or, um, you know, again, I, I'm not the, the domain expert on this, but I can tell you that was the concept of that. It was pretty much up to the judgment of the users, you know, whether they thought this was a, a really, um, not so much in terms of repair difficulty, but a location was going to have a large consequence if it took a while to restore water to that particular area. So let me ask you, I guess maybe the way that comes to me, Dr. Fontaine, is, is the location index used within that consequence index, or can you just go on your location index and say, give me all the high-risk location point? Oh, it, it's, it, well, actually with the GIS, we could look at all the locations mm -hmm. that had a value of three. Right. We could actually query that, or you could change the attributes of that. So you could look, any data you put in, we can now go back and look at in terms of the, in terms of its spatial analysis, which I really think is great. Um, but it's, it's used primarily to calculate this consequence index. So okay. A, a, a more difficult location with a more difficult repair with a bigger diameter is going to have the highest consequence index. Okay. If, if that makes that makes sense. Now, one thing I wanted to say is that when we, you know, when we developed this, this was not. We knew this wouldn't be an end-all tool. In fact, we were trying to develop a beginning. But one of the advantages of having this in ERAMs that we've talked about is that you can bring in SARLS data. Mm -hmm. You can bring in traffic data. We could bring in a lot of other data we had to allow us to improve instead of a one, two, three, 
maybe we or maybe you as users can come up with some concepts of how we can get a better estimate of what these consequences index can be. And we could use some of our GIS information that maybe help us estimate that. Mm -hmm. We could do some refining of it. Um, another question is, how is the cost estimation calculated for each pipe segment? Is it based on linear feed or unit costs, or is it just uh, cost? I think uh, I'm saying this off, uh, without fully remembering how that was done. I think it's based on um, a cost per foot. But I okay. could be mistaken about that. Wait, Teresa we'll may have to check. That. We'll have to confirm that with Dr. Gray. We'll confirm that. Um, so our pipe segments have different lengths. How would that affect the result? Um, well, in the... So all of our pipe segments also have different lengths. We've lost our data or not. It's not pulling up now, but all of the pipe segments have different lengths. And that length is used in when we do that normalized break ratio for the number of breaks uh, per mile per year. That's adjusted based on the length. And the cost we'll have to get back on you on because this is something Dr. Grigg developed. I thought that was also, if I'm not mistaken, that's also based on, I was going to look in this table, but it's not coming up. That's also based on the length of the segment. So he's putting in a cost per unit length, and I, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that cost is being adjusted by the length of the segment we have. But we'll confirm that. We'll confirm that. And follow up. When I send out the um, recording, we'll also send out some of the answers to these questions. Are there any other questions? If not, and since we've lost our data, we will um, we'll end a couple minutes early and. Uh, once again, just we will send out. You will get a survey when we in the webinar. A survey will come out to you. We'd appreciate any feedback you have on that. As we mentioned, we're trying to take these tools that have developed for research and academic purposes and put them into application. Um, you know, especially with the growth of open source GIS information, it's really easier to start making this information more available um, without the need for um, having specific versions of Excel on your thing, it's you know platform independent. So if you've ever done these tools and you tried to download a specific version of Excel or anything else, you know that can be problematic. So we're trying to make it platform independent and just so anyone can bring it up and use it with an internet browser. So we'd appreciate any feedback you have because what we want is this being applied now that it's coming out of research and um, you know, we think there's great opportunity for the water industry to really get, um, be able to share data easier. So your feedback is important to us. Fill out the survey, and I will send out an email with the YouTube link that you can go back if there's any other, if you want to view this again or have questions. Um, you know, and just feel free to email me if you have questions, you're trying to do something down the road and you have questions, feel free to send us an email and we'll get you the answers. And with that, we really thank you for participating today. And um, Thank you yeah. so much and good luck to you and your jobs. Yeah, it's an important job. Thank you, everyone.